Hey everyone, it's Michelle with Hope, and welcome to day two of our Family Education Weekend. How incredible was yesterday? I just loved having all of the kids there with us participating, and their parents, and having all of those activities that were just family oriented. Don't you think that was amazing? Today, we're gonna still have our virtual exhibit hall, where we can win $250 gift cards, two of them, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Also, in our breakout sessions, we're gonna have some amazing activities again today, and we're gonna be giving away two gift cards again in each session for an adult and a kid, and they're to Amazon. And who doesn't love an Amazon gift card? You can buy whatever you'd like. We can't wait to have y'all have to spend the day with us today. This afternoon and this evening, again, is geared toward all families. So make sure your computer's charged, make sure y'all have a bag of popcorn, and y'all are gonna just sit back and relax and get started with us today. Hey everyone, welcome to day two of our live Family Education Weekend. My name is Jonathan James with Hope Charities and it is really a great privilege to be with you guys. Hey YouTube friends, if you're watching live right now, jump in there and hit subscribe and ring the bell. Do us a favor so we can learn more about you and get you the, the latest information and updates when they first hit. And then also if you're joining us live from Facebook, we are so glad that you're here. And we really hope that you get to hang out with us today, all day, in this day two of Family Education Weekend. We are so glad to be here, even if it is virtual, because it means an opportunity for us to get together and still be able to learn from each other during these times. And look, I've got some great people coming to hang out with me right now to come and do some interviews that I think are going to be a lot of fun, informational things that you'll be able to get to learn. And one thing that I'm super, super excited about is... Today, we've got my good friend, Andy Matthews, who'll be joining us, which I'm excited about him participating. You're going to learn from somebody who's been around the block a little while, in his 50s, living with hemophilia, doing some neat things. So we'll hear from Andy. And then another great set of guests that I am so thrilled about. This is Family Education Weekend, and I invited my parents to come and join us this weekend to talk a little bit about raising me. Now, look, hey, I can't promise you that it's going to be a clean interview. I mean, they might say some things that might be embarrassing. I mean, you never know. Uh, but uh, they're going to come and share some uh, ups and downs that I went through as a child living with hemophilia. And I thought, what a great opportunity for us to be able to hang out and talk with them some this weekend to learn more. Maybe you're a parent 
and you're wanting to learn, man, this is new to me. I'm not sure how to do this. I'm raising a child with this bleeding disorder and I just don't know how to navigate well. They've got some great advice for you. So I want you to hear from David and Debbie James in just a little bit. And then uh, we'll hear from some of our sponsors and it's gonna be a great time. So hang out with us. If you haven't registered yet, there's still time. You actually can still sign up and get some links to some separate invitation only Zoom meetings that are happening for the rest of the day today. We would love for you to come and spend some time with us live today and be a part of this weekend and this event today specifically. Um, we're gonna have some great uh, topics and sessions that I'll tell you a little bit more about in just a little while. But in the meantime, I'm gonna see if we can get jump on this and get our good friend Andy Matthews to join us right now. All right, I've got my good friend Andy Matthews here with me. Andy, welcome to Family Education Weekend. It is great to see you. Thanks, good to be here, Jonathan, good to be here. Yeah, it is, uh, I can't believe we are still in some level of quarantine. I don't know about your house, but uh, around where we live, it is, uh, people are starting to get out and about and it just gives me so much joy because I'm, I'm looking forward to the day we can finally be in the same room together again, which hopefully Absolutely. will happen in the next near, near term. But um, man, it's, it's good to still connect even over this, this video thing, even if we can't see each other in person, so. Absolutely. Hey, I want to say a big thank you to Specialty Therapeutic Care and Acaria Health for sponsoring this weekend. Uh, you know, we really couldn't do what we do if it wasn't for the support. And you guys have been behind us uh, really since the beginning. And yeah. so I just want to say a big thank you to that. And uh, really, really appreciate your support, Andy. No problem. Glad to do it. We, we love hope and we've been there from the beginning and we, you know, hope to be continue. So, uh, and the family education weekend, it's all about education. Uh, I, I am the, where I am with my hemophilia and quality of life because my parents didn't have a family education weekend, but they were educated yeah. and they would have loved to have what y'all have at this education weekend. When I was growing up in the late sixties, early seventies, I can promise you that my mom would have thought she died and went to heaven. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, this whole weekend is really surrounded around families. And for people who may be watching this and don't know, you yourself have hemophilia. You've grown up with this. And tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up and, and really specifically about the family support. I mean, your mom and dad were in it to win it. So mm -hmm. how was that growing up with having a good support system? And how important is that? Absolutely. My, my, uh, Parents found out when I was uh, six months old and my mom kind of started freaking out. My dad went to throw up in the bathroom. He tells it, he didn't know what to expect, but he, I don't know when it was, but he was always in athletics, uh, Baylor, Letterman, all kinds of stuff. And he knew, you know, diddly about hemophilia, but he knew if he could get me to become as strong as I could be physically, that I would probably do well. And my mom quickly learned if she could get me, keep me out of the emergency room by self-infusion uh, or her doing the infusions at home wasn't factored back then. It was called cryoprecipitate like plasma that I would live, you know, be able to live a fairly normal life. And we did both those things. My dad got me a bicycle and got me swimming, never played sports most, you know, like you probably didn't either. But uh, I, I rode a bike all the time and swam, you know, at a very early age. And there's not many 55-year-old hemophiliacs severe with as little as joint damage as I have. And I attribute most of that to having the factor cryo in my house, as well as being very active. And my parents were just very positive. We didn't really even have a treatment center. We lived in Corpus Christi, Texas. There wasn't a treatment center there. There was one in San Antonio, but even back then that was a long ways away. So we just found a, a hematologist that knew enough about hemophilia that said, you need to get that stuff in your house and not be going to the emergency room. And it was to, his name was Dr. Sharp. And it was to his credit that we're, we were able to live a very normal life like that. Nothing like it is today, but it's still better than spending hours uh, upon hours in an ER waiting to get a shot. Meanwhile, your joints are just deteriorating rapidly. 
Yeah. I remember you sharing some stories over the past that, that talked about how you, you even had blood drives and things where, cause cryo was really a very localized yes. small group of people that had to donate in order to be able to get the, the treatment. Yeah. So you, you had even blood drives in your name, right? My mom went to work for the civil service early on to get insurance. My dad was an accountant, didn't really have, even back then, it was hard to get insurance. So my mom went to work for the civil service and literally called VT-31, the hangar at the Naval Air Station, Corpus Christi, Texas, a VT-31 sponsored me. And then uh, unbelievable enough, the Nueces County Blood Bank would make the crowd precipitate for free if I would bring, get my own blood. So today, what does it cost? <laughs> Half a million dollars or more to keep one of us kicking. Back then it was free, um, but it was nothing like it is today. But anyway. Wow, wow. So you really had an advantage because you had such a strong support system. And mm -hmm. what would you say to, to parents? I mean, looking back on your, your years of growing up, you know, I mean, you know, your, your parents were out there doing everything they could to keep insurance and to help you get mm -hmm. the blood drives going and all of those things. I mean, you, you had to probably, you know, I, th I find some people either embarrassed by that or they feel like a superstar kid. And so which one of those were you and, and, and what would you encourage parents to do with that? No, I mean, I wasn't embarrassed by it. I, I will say I would have had a better, more healthy self-esteem growing up had I been just more proud of it, you know, but uh, I still wasn't embarrassed by it. Um, my mom knew that she needed to learn how to infuse her son in the, you know, quick. And she used to practice on an orange, you know, um, and she, she learned very quick. Um, once we were told we need to keep it in a deep freezer in our refrigerator, we don't know how to give a shot, but she learned, uh, really quick to do it. And so I would just say as parents, whatever your issues are, you know, it's the same issues today. It's just a little bit more advanced, but still the issues in hemophilia is the same. You want to keep yourself from bleeding. Uh, and if you do bleed, you want to rectify it as quick as possible. Yeah, so true. So true. The thing I want to uh, 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 say, Jonathan, before I forget, um, the, the way parents handle hemophilia will be how your kids will handle hemophilia. That's so good, Andy. And I, and I, I really think that the value of that is, is so on point where how the parents respond and look, we all have our weak moments. I mean, like your dad went and threw up in the bathroom, you know, I mean, look, it, it is, it is absolutely okay to have those moments where you're not able to, 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 to be strong. But I think also at the same time, like how you, you know, are willing to just kind of face it head on together as a team, uh, really makes a huge difference. And so, man, for anybody watching this who you're just maybe questioning or wondering, like, what is it you bring to the table? And, and, and you know, I, there is such a, a fine, you know, every, it's an everyday decision to make sometimes to just encourage yourself and encourage your child. Or if you're, if you're an adult living with him, if you encourage yourself so that you can be a good example of your kids, whatever that looks like, for you is that man that just just be grateful for the support system that you do have and do the best you can to look at it with a positive outlook because that is going to change everything in your life from the point of action to the point of result you will find that positive uh, vantage point is going to to determine the outcome Man, thank you so much. And look, if you would like to get in touch with Andy, you can do that simply by visiting the Acaria Health website or especially Therapeutic Care. Um, but uh, if, if there's anything that, that uh, we can do to help you get connected, please let us know. But Andy, Absolutely. thank you so much for being here this weekend and being a part of it. All right, take care. Well, I have a special treat for everyone today. I want to say again, thank you so much for joining us for Family Education Weekend. And I wanted to take a moment just as we're talking about family to introduce my own parents, David and Debbie James. And I've got them with me here uh, this weekend to talk a little bit about what life is growing up, uh, like growing up with hemophilia and raising a, a son with hemophilia from uh, 30 plus years ago. So uh, so anyway, mom and dad, it is great to see you here at Family Education Weekend. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. 
Well, it's great to be here. And um, man, I, I, it's, it's funny because you, you think, uh, you, you know, we, we get to do a lot of these interviews with doctors and nurses and physicians and different folks, but um, it's a, a little, little, you know, unique to be able to interview your own parents. So I appreciate you guys participating and helping us out. I think a lot of people are going to enjoy hearing from you guys. <laughs> Good. Well, um, I, I really wanted to start out with a few basic questions, but I think my, my, one of the things that I would love to do is just open it up to you to, to share a little bit about, I'm, I'm 42, maybe 43, I don't know, can't keep track. And uh, so, you know, 35 years ago, hemophilia looked a lot different than it does today. And you guys were brand new to this because I was a spontaneous mutation. So things were quite a bit different than they are today. And, uh, you know, I, I think it would just be really helpful for us to talk about the support system. I know for me, I would not be where I'm at today if it wasn't for all of the sacrifices that both of you made and um, really, really helped along the way. And so let's just start out from the beginning. Talk a little bit about you guys got married. I'll, I'll fast forward the first part of the story. You, you moved to Texas, uh, wanted kids and boom, you're pregnant and here comes this strapping, handsome, strikingly amazing looking boy, <laughs> but something seems wrong and you can't quite put your finger on it. And, uh, and how did, how did that all, how did that all start? Well, um, we were very excited. You were our first and, um, you know, we had you and we counted all the fingers and toes <laughs> and everything looked perfect. And um, we were just a happy little family um, for about two years. And um, you continued to have a lot of bruising and uh, even picking you up out of the crib caused finger bruising on your back. And um, you had dark circles under your eyes and we knew something was not completely right. And uh, we took you to the pediatrician and they did um, tests and nothing showed up. And um, we just continued on. And, um, you know, finally we got some answers and, and uh, <clears throat> which was a total shock because hemophilia was not uh, in my background at all. And, um, I'd never been exposed to anyone that had hemophilia, and um, and so uh, you know our journey began at that diagnosis time. Well, Polly, uh, it was we knew there were issues from actually almost day one. We just didn't know what they were, the the problems were, and the doctors didn't know. Um, um, they even had we even had a scare whether or not we could bring you home right away yeah because uh you had they had an issue when when you were circumcised at the hospital and you continued to bleed which should have been an indication to the medical profession but you know this was not known uh, uh, about by normal most doctors at the time so we knew there were problems early on and one little story that uh, was heartbreaking to me for the longest time, when you were real little, uh, before we knew you had hemophilia, um, you were kind of crawling on the floor and you, you had an elbow bleed, which we did not know. And, you know, I tossed and tumbled with you on the floor, not knowing anything. And at some point you had a, a, an elbow bleed when you were crawling and you couldn't hardly crawl. And um, in my ignorance, I was trying to stretch your elbow out. I was trying to get you to work it out, thinking it's a muscle, you know, that's what would happen to me, you know, that work it out, son. Uh, don't bleed on the carpet type uh, dad, you know? And um, broke my heart later when I realized what I was doing was, hurting you more and didn't know it. But um, anyway, we would pick you up, mom would pick you up from out of your crib, literally 
And some days it didn't happen every day, but some days her fingerprints would literally bruise you. And you could see your her fingerprints where she picked you up, just simply out of the crib. So we knew early on there was some issue. We kept going back to the doctor, the pediatrician. Uh, they'd given you a shot. And uh, I just knew they had broken needle off in your hip. And boy, I was, I was pretty put out with the doctor. Went back to him. He ran a bunch of tests. He ran a bunch of x-rays. And uh, he was nervous because I was, I was put out with him. I'm thinking, y'all have done something wrong here. But even he still did not point us in the direction of hemophilia. I think at that point, he was just trying to protect his own situation there. He didn't know any better. And that's how we ended up at Cook Children's Medical Center in Fort Worth. And a Dr. Mialy, within uh, 10 minutes of seeing him, he was a hematologist, oncologist, and within 10 minutes of seeing him, he says, uh, it'll take a couple of weeks before the tests are back, but we are, I can tell you just about 90% positive that your son has hemophilia. And that's where it began. You know, I'll often say that, that the journey that the patient has is very different from the journey that the parent has. And so Absolutely. This is one of the reasons why I was excited to talk to y'all at this conference was because I really think that so many parents have their own story that's just it's just very different. I mean, I, I had my own story and, and, and the journey that I've walked out, but that's me dealing with my own physical pain inside the boundaries of this body and the boundaries of life. But, you know, the, the pain that you guys went through were so, I mean, so many different emotions and, and, and things. And so, but talk to me a little bit about, uh, you know, things went along and we started getting treatment after that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm at home treatment wasn't possible initially. Right. right. So, That's so, right. uh, tell me a little bit about next steps after that. Well, uh, we had regular clinic visits, mm -hmm. but if there was a problem between those visits, we had to rush you to cook children's, uh, emergency room. And we did that on a regular basis. Cause at that time you were too little, we couldn't give home infusions. And um, we did that for quite a while, some midnight visits on a regular basis. Yep. <laughs> and uh, your dad was uh, traveling, working some and, um, you know, getting caught in other states. And it was me and, you know, a friend running me to the emergency room regularly. And uh, so it was scary as a parent, you know. Yeah. There was a... Uh point there and I want to say it was in the early 80s when the AIDS crisis began and uh, I can remember vividly um, they put you on cryoprecipitate not not the whole blood and not the factor at that point they were concerned about the factor and this was before it was heat treated days even and so they put you on cryoprecipitate, precipitate, which again had to be there in the hospital. But I was talking with Dr. Miali, we were, and I asked him, I said, well, you know, we're really concerned about this. He said, well, the cryoprecipitate precipitate is, is from a whole lot less donors. It, 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 so the odds are much greater that you would not have a problem with that. And he said, but honestly, and this was his, his statements that he says, it would be better to infuse you even if you got HIV, the HIV virus, because he says they will they will uh, come up they will uh, find a cure for that, and it would be better to go ahead and for you to have the factor to to save the joint damage than it would be to withhold the factor from you. Which he was very very sincere in that, and I'm certain he fully believed that. And uh, that's just how ignorant we all were in those days. No one really knew how devastating the HIV virus would be to the hemophiliac community. 
Yeah, I mean, it brings a, up an interesting question because I, I think, you know, some people know the history, some people don't, but, um, you know, today things are, are, are very different. But one thing sure. that I, I feel like is, is similar is that people still have to deal with the emotions of all of these things, right? Your, your child might be taken away from you because there's this bruising. You might have this situation where, where maybe there's this treatment that's got to be infused and you don't really know what all is in it. Right. You know, there, there's, there's uh, financial pressures. There's how do you keep insured? You know, talk about that a little bit because some of those things are still going on today where it's very challenging for people to manage the emotions of it all. But you had a lot of challenges with work and staying insured through those years to keep the treatment coming as well, right? Well, when you were born, I was, I was working for a company and we had hospital insurance, but it had a million dollar cap on it. Well, we ran through that million dollars. I don't know if you recall, but, and I know it's a lot more expensive today, but even back in the eighties, uh, to keep you healthy with your factor, mostly the factors, the huge cost. Uh, but of course we were running back into, to the hospital too. So, I mean, we, this was before home infusions and, um, it was, you were running bills in $300,000 a year range. And I know you probably, for you, you're a higher user of factor. So that's significantly more today than it was then, but you can go through a million dollars in a short period of time. And if you were to have any surgeries or anything like that, of course, that again, multiplies the, the cost in a hurry. So anyway, so we lost the insurance and we were in Texas and there, there were, there were no laws that protected us from losing that insurance. There was, we, you were labeled uninsurable and th there was no law that we couldn't force anybody to insure you. So we fell into a program called Texas Cripple Children's Fund, which was uh, a wonderful fund. And, um, so thankful that that was in place. And we drew from that, along with many other hemophiliac patients, that crippled children's fund started running out of money. And um, so then that pressed us to start trying to find other ways to take care of you. And I'm writing my congressman, I'm writing uh, the governor, I'm, I'm, I'm making as many phone calls. I'm just, I'm scratching. Uh, our church was very helpful. Uh, our parents were both very supportive. You had grandparents on both sides that just loved you to the core. And uh, so we were very, very blessed and fortunate. We had a lot of support, but we still, it's a huge struggle. That's, that's amazing. You right. uprooted our family from right. Texas. We didn't have any family in Louisiana. We didn't right. have any relationships, really. We just, you just picked up and said, I'll go find a job. I'll that's right. get rid of our house and get a new house. We'll just, we'll just move the family. I remember yeah. one particular yeah. story that I'd like for you to share that really sticks out to me. And I know we're running short on time, but um, there was a, a period when we moved to Louisiana that my elbow had deteriorated significantly. We didn't really know. I had been going to some physical therapy. Right. Uh, X-rays had not been done in a very, very long time. And so they didn't really right. know how bad the joint damage was. They thought that they just worked it out, right. that it would get better in, in my range of motion. But turned out it was actually severe bone deterioration that had occurred. Right. And right. I was at the threat of losing my arm because- That's correct. Were, that is uh, correct. Accelerated so so quickly. So, tell me a little bit about we we got here on the hopes of getting medication and getting treatment and getting therapy, and then we find out that it everything works. We can get medication. Oh, but you need surgery. We can't do that. And surgery was not covered. Correct. Right. Um, that was an extremely difficult 
place uh, without going into a lot of detail there. And I understand some of the Shriners logic, but the Shriners literally turned us down. Shriners Hospital said, no, this is not an orthopedic. Now it was an orthopedic doctor that wrote them the letters of request to take you on as a patient. We're at, we're at a very difficult place. And literally your arm, your elbow was at a place where you were, it was close to amputation at the elbow. Your bone deterioration had gotten so bad and you were in so much constant pain all the time. And um, the only thing we could try and figure out was to try and get on a federal program again, same problem, I was working, had a little bit of income, could not get on uh, Medicaid. And if you could get on Medicare, you could automatically get on Medicaid for you. And so we didn't know all of that. We'd been turned down again and again. So one day I go up to the uh, Medicare, Medicaid office, whatever it is called in, here in Baton Rouge. And I was, I was just so uh, distraught. My son's arm is about to be amputated if we don't do something and do something quick. And I was at the place where I was willing to be arrested before I would be, before I would leave that building, somebody was going to have to tell me. Because when I got there, went through the normal procedure, met with a lady. She said, well, you've got to go across town and talk to these folks over here. And I'd already been across town and that sent me back over here and sent me back over there. I said, no, ma'am. I said, I am not leaving here till somebody can tell me why my son cannot get the surgery he needs. And uh, it was, of course, the whole room, there was a room full of people there. And I, of course, I did not have any concern about that. I didn't care. I said, no, we're, you're not, you're, you don't understand, ma'am. You can call the, uh, you can call the police, you can call the security, but I'm going to call the television station. I'm going to call the radio station and you can call whoever you want to, but I'm not leaving here to someone can explain to me why I cannot get help. Well, of course, all that's going on. And there's a whole bunch of murmuring, murmuring going on. And finally, the lady says, hang on, someone in the back, one of the managers wants to talk to you. And again, I, I'm, I'm just in a, terrible state to begin with. They bring me back to the back side of the building, step into this lady's office. Very nice lady. I don't know who she was. To this day, I don't, I don't know who she was, but I sat down and told her the whole story. And she says, uh, Mr. James, don't worry about it. We're going to take care of this. I don't know what she did. But within just a day or so, a hospital says you're approved to get the surgery. And then, uh, and of course, when they, at that time, AIDS was really going everywhere. So when they, the day that uh, you had surgery, our dear pastor friends to this day, Bob and Mary Ann Paulus flew down at their own expense come and be with us and uh, all those the all the the people who were going into surgery they wouldn't let us go but very so far with you and um, all of those people that were going to be in the operating room at that point they were dressed up like they were going to walk on the moon all of them were totally covered head to toe at this point they did you know again they didn't AIDS was very, very rampant by this stage. And they, they were still in very much a learning curve. And um, uh, anyway, 
you got that that critical surgery, and uh, Dr. Ali was a major part of that, and so were many others, Dr. Lessinger, uh, so many other people. And uh, it's a lot of well-meaning people, but you know, sometimes these laws and these regulations and these rules can really be very, very frustrating and uh, and very difficult sometimes to navigate, particularly when you're in a state of just you're just you're just trying to get help and you're not good at asking for help. And most people aren't. And most people that's that is why there is such a huge huge need for hope for hemophilia and hope charities because most people when they find themselves in a medical crisis uh, they don't know how to let even they don't even know how to let their family know what their needs are and they 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 don't want to have to ask for help most people don't want to ask for help and uh, that's why there's such a huge huge need yeah i uh <clears throat> It is amazing to see all of the the outcome that is that has been uh, possible because of um, you know the sacrifice of so many people. It's not just us. It's it's right. all the people that have surrounded us. Look, if you're watching this today and you're thinking, "Gosh, I just don't have the kind of family support," maybe you're looking at me and going, "Jonathan, the reason you are where you are is because you've had just great parents and you've had great support system." And hey, I would agree with you. But look, if you're in that situation and you don't have that, that is what hope is here for. That is why we're here. We are inviting you. Uh, to be a part of our family, to be a part of that support system. And so if you need David and Debbie, or if you need me, or if you need someone else that's on our team, we really want to be here to help be a support to you. If there's any questions you have or anything, you can put them in the comments. We'll do our best to respond to those. You can always email us at info at hope-charities.org. And uh, we sure appreciate you being here, spending your time watching this video today with us and being a part of Family Education Weekend. We know that uh, we hope to be together in person before it's too long, but at the same time, these moments are so critical. And once again, uh, David and Debbie, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. And here's a word from our sponsors. Hi, we're CVS Specialty, and you've come to the right place for specialty medication and one-on-one -on -one support. We want to help make living with your specialty condition a little easier. Let's start with getting your medication. Most specialty pharmacies only offer delivery, but with us, you have options. We can provide convenient, contactless home delivery of your medication, but if you prefer to pick it up, we can have it available for you at any CVS pharmacy location. The choice is yours. We also know that taking a specialty medication, particularly if you're new to treatment, can come with questions. So we make sure you have access to a nurse and pharmacist specially trained in conditions like yours. Together, they're known as your CVS specialty care team, and you can rely on them for trusted information. Send your care team a secure message on our website or mobile app. They can help with questions about your medication order status, billing, or even side effects. For even more convenience, use our digital tools to manage your medication. You can refill prescriptions, monitor order status, make payments, and much more anytime online. These are just some of the ways we can help you manage your specialty condition. We're CBS Specialty, and we'll be here when you need us, because you are our specialty. You've got to be able to live your life to their fullest. You can't just let hemophilia hold you behind. I can't say I've ever been a traditional hemophiliac. I rock climb, whitewater kayak. I go out in the wilderness and hike around. My name is Nicholas, and I am a severe hemophiliac, A. I was diagnosed at birth, so basically within the first two days of my life I was diagnosed. I, I think I came fully to terms with it around age seven um, when I had non-Hodgkin's Burkitt's lymphoma. My HTC doctor at the time, she also had cancer, and so I got to spend a lot of time with her both talking about my cancer and my hemophilia, so I was able to kind of come to terms with that. What I would say to someone who has hemophilia or has 
don't let hemophilia hold you back. You can manage the disease with your medication. You don't need to worry so much about it. I mean, I've broken my forearm, I've broken my nose, twisted ankles, doing the activities I do, but I haven't had any spontaneous bleeds, which is great. So I've gone from 72 spontaneous bleeds in a year to zero spontaneous bleeds in a year. you're having a bad day, it's nothing better than going out and fishing or going hiking. It doesn't make it difficult doing infusions outdoors. I've infused on a kayak in the middle of an ocean to infusing on the side of a, a rock climbing base on El Capitan, hanging from ropes. So it doesn't make it difficult any more than sitting at the kitchen table for myself. You gotta try new things. If you don't try new things, you're not able to you know, move on and move past what you think you can't do. But you really can't. I don't need to let hemophilia keep me down. I can kind of tell hemophilia, hey, you know, I want to go out hiking today. I want to go fishing. I want to go climb a 10,000 foot mountain. I want to uh, go with my buddies off-roading or skiing or snowboarding or surfing and I'm able to do it. Not letting boundaries be set by someone else, but by my own self safely that's that's pretty much where i like to live my live my life For 70 years, we've been on quite a journey together with exciting twists and turns. Today, it may feel like the way is blocked. You may feel isolated and alone. But even on the darkest road, we know who to turn to. Each other. Your journey is our journey. We're always moving forward with your long-term health in mind, and we'll continue to support you along this new path every mile of the journey. At Bear. We create medicine that treats bleeding disorders like hemophilia, so Victor can keep doing what's in his blood. At Bear, this is why we science. Hey, I just want to say a big thank you to all of our sponsors from those videos that you just watched. We could not do what we do if it wasn't for their support. And so thank all of you so much for jumping in here. If you're watching this, this is your first time participating, you can actually go to our website at hopeforhemophilia.org. Look at the event, Family Education Weekend, which is just below there. Click that on the homepage. That will take you to our page and you can actually learn more about all of our sponsors who are supporting this event this weekend and some of them are even doing a raffle and drawing so if you click on their booth spaces you'll be able to learn more about them and maybe sign up for a raffle so that should be a lot of fun but look we got one more coming sandy from paragon you don't want to miss this she's a great joy to have so i'm going to invite her right now to join us and talk just a little bit more about what she's up to all right, I've got Sandy Williams here with me from Paragon Healthcare. And Sandy, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us for Family Education Weekend. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoy speaking with you and this is a fabulous organization. Well, we're so glad to have you. And if I'm not mistaken, this might be your first HOPE event to speak at uh, that you've been to so far, is that right? It is. That is true. I have never spoken at a HOPE event and um, I don't usually speak at many events, to be <laughs> honest with you. So this is new to me. Well, look, we're, we're hopefully we'll make this easy on you, but I'm sure you're going to do great. 
if I'm not mistaken, you've been around the community actually for quite a while and, and really been, been around uh, in the area. So tell us a little bit about your role with Paragon and where you're located and kind of what you do. Okay, great. I am in the Boston area. I've been doing covering the Boston area or territory for 18 years. I started in specialty pharmacy as a consumer advocate and I moved on to manufacturing sales and I have come full circle and am back in specialty pharmacy, kind of where my heart is. And I'm an account executive for the company and um, I still have the Boston area, deal directly with patients and physicians, it, just trying to help the patients uh, get the services they need and um, the assistance they need and do a good job at that and making sure that uh, everybody is doing okay. That's so good. That's so good. Well, you know, there's not many people that have seen all the transitions that the community has been through, like you have yeah. being in and around it for so long. But, um, but I, I would say that, you know, it, that wisdom that you gain from a mm -hmm. long time also really helps you have a perspective that's probably uh, just a broader perspective is, is, is better than people who are just now starting to get in involved and there's a lot of parents that are joining us this weekend and people that just found out that they have a diagnosis and so to have somebody like you in their corner to be able to say hey let me tell you where we've been and what what you can expect and what's next and so um i'm just excited to hear that you're you're doing what you're doing yeah no i mean it's where my heart is and once you're in hemophilia you never leave hemophilia That's right. <laughs> i say to everyone but really the first thing you can say to a new family is it's going to be okay. You're that's, going to be okay. There's a lot of support. Yeah. That's so good. One of the things that I think has been neat about this weekend, we've already heard from several people talk about how the, the, you know, the, the medical professionals, people in your role, and even sometimes the doctors become almost an extension of your family. They become an extension of your support mm -hmm. network. And, and uh, I can think a long time, you know, I, I have a bleeding disorder and grew up with that. And, and I, I can think, man, sometimes the, I can remember the first nurse who took care of me and, you know, and all these things. And, and in that, I, I, it, they seem like aunts and uncles. They seem like people that I, that I, you know, grew up with. And so uh, it does become a lot like a family. So tell me a little bit about what your passion is and what drives you to do your job excellently and, and also like just, just kind of some of those, that perspective you've had as being kind of the, the, the adopted aunt, I'm sure for a lot of people. Sure, I mean, I mean, that's what drives me is the passion of being part of these families, uh, watching these little kids go from having bleeds and then growing up to these fantastic, well-adjusted adults and really have gone through quite a bit, but you see them grow and I've been to, graduations and weddings and uh, school events for some of these kids. And it's just, they become family even for myself. And it's that's very important to me that I feel connected to people and just knowing that you're helping someone and it could be as small as a phone call late at night when a mom is, is ready to just pull her hair out and doesn't know how to do, do it anymore. And I know they have a huge community support system but sometimes, you know, they're close to someone else like myself or, I mean, I've been in it 18 years. So it's, it's a lot of listening and a lot of connecting with people. And that makes it fun for me is um, just getting to know people and helping them with the struggles and making sure that things get better. And, uh, and I, it's been rewarding for me. That's so good. Well, in many ways, you're giving them that, that hope that... Uh, right they need to yeah. be able to know that it is gonna, there is a way out of whatever they're going through and there is a way to live yeah. successfully with a bleeding disorder. And uh, sometimes people just need that encouragement. You know, one of my favorite definitions of the word encourage is to inspire courage. And I love that because that's so much of what you're doing, Sandy, is you're out there giving people courage when sometimes maybe they don't have it for themselves. So thank you for all the hard work you do. And uh, 
Big thanks to Paragon as well for sponsoring this weekend. We really could not do what we do if it wasn't for the support of great organizations like you guys. And um, we really just uh, love working with you and uh, look forward to seeing more of you this weekend with sessions coming and, and, and all kinds of things. Scavenger hunts. I think you guys are doing a bunch of stuff. So we'll hopefully see you very soon in another session. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I hope the weekend goes, go, goes fantastic for everybody. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. We'll see you soon. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. I've got my good friend, Norma Castaneda with me today from Fidelis Pharmacy. Norma, it is great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us for Family Education Weekend. Well, thank you, Jonathan. I'm, I'm really happy to be here too. And albeit we're uh, virtual here, but very happy to be here. Yeah. Well, it is so good to see you. I know that you have been a big force in the hemophilia community for many, many years and um, would love to hear a little bit about your role and your involvement in the community, kind of what you're doing and what you're excited about with the pharmacy these days. Sure, sure. Well, I, I think I'm meeting my uh, over 10 year mark in this community. So it's really exciting to um, see how we have progressed and all the exciting things that we've done um, over the past 10 years. And I'm really excited to have joined this team, uh, Fidelis Specialty Pharmacy. Uh, we're doing awesome. Uh, we have two locations, one in the Los Angeles uh, County area, and we're also in Las Vegas, Nevada, but we have extended our footprint into some other States, and uh, we're really excited to work with you guys, and um, you know, share some of our our experience, and and um, also be here for the community that we love. That's great, mm -hmm. that's great. Well, it's so wonderful to uh, to have you here. And I know one of the things that that I've always appreciated about you, Norma, is that you you're a think outside of the box kind of person, and you love to think creatively and and think about how to really meet unique needs, and so. I know there's some some tools that you're working on with trying to develop some programs for Spanish speaking people and for all kinds of different things. But what is it? What are you most excited about over the next year or so as far as the pharmacy and your involvement in the community goes? Yes. Well, I think I'm excited about some art programs that we're developing for children. And I think that with everything that we have been through with this pandemic, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, our kids are a little bit more disengaged because they're in a virtual learning environment. I mean, let's be honest, that's boring. I don't like to be in front of the computer for seven hours a day. Right. Um, so what we have done is we're thinking outside the box and getting some children's programs together, still doing them virtually uh, so that we all stay safe until it's it's okay to, to actually meet in person. But um, I think some of those programs, what we have heard from, our community members is, you know, that the kids may be feeling a little sad or disengaged or they haven't seen some of their friends in a long time and we don't know exactly how it's affecting them. And a lot of times uh, there's some kids that may be very vocal and then there's some kids that may stay quiet and they might not want to talk about it. But we think through art, um, they're able to have these self-expressions and be able to you know, really uh, learn about art, but at the same time express themselves and you know, see what they're feeling and, and feel good about it. So um, we are working on that. We've done some other tracks that um, we believe are helping during the times that we're in. Uh, we put some uh, great programs for um, yoga. We did some cooking classes um, and they were really fun for families and it got the whole family involved, you know, it got the kids involved, their parents. And um, we had a chef that was quite funny while he was working and um, so, so some of those outside of the box things, I think it really uh, engages our families and their kids to do it together. That's so great. I, I, I just love that, that uh, willingness to just try to be flexible and meet needs. And gosh, with this whole pandemic thing, we have all had to do a lot of that. And uh, I, I feel like sometimes uh, we're doing organizational yoga to try to meet needs, to try to bend this way and do all kinds of other things that we didn't expect we'd have to do. But 
Uh, but you guys do that well, and I'm excited to see uh, just, just how you're bringing all that together. And I really, too, want to just say a big thank you uh, to you and Fidelis for supporting this Family Education Weekend. We truly could not do what we do if it wasn't for your support, and uh, we really do appreciate you guys being a part of all of it. Well, we appreciate being able to contribute to Jonathan, because I think uh, what you all do is just phenomenal for the families. And I uh, have had the opportunity to work with you guys for uh, several years now. And I love what you do. And I think this is a good space for families to learn. And your programs are always innovative. So we try to catch up with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's great. And I know you guys are going to be doing a session and I'm super excited about that because you have uh, Gina, I think who's doing a presentation that's going to be talking a little bit about health and wellness and how to eat well and things like that. And, and that's so, so important. Yes. Yes. And we, we put it out to the community to see who would be interested in being our speaker and uh, Gina Weiberg, she's very uh, active in Chicago, Illinois, and she's done a lot for that chapter, and she's always been interested in uh, nutrition and so forth. So she put together a really fun program. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we say, oh gosh, we're going to talk about health, and you know, I don't want to talk about that, but she made some pretty fun. And I think some of the things that um, I, I got to take a little glimpse of what she came up with. Uh, it's really nice because she gives you little morsels of how to just incorporate a little bit of healthy every day without making this drastic change. And I think that's what's so important for our kids is to, you know, even if we just add a couple of vegetables and fruits and, you know, that makes us a little bit healthier and then get moving. That was the part that I think is so important, um, especially right now when they're at home, how do we get the kids to go for a walk, you know, or how do we get them to just move a little bit more so we have good, healthy joints and they're able to, you know, stay healthy while they're home. That's so good. So, so important. What I love about what y'all are doing is incorporating the kids and, you know, a lot of our programs focus on maybe one demographic or another or a certain segment of the community, like we just had our Profi conference recently, which was really focused a lot on young adults and how to be able to take care of your joints well by doing regimented treatment. But uh, we, you know, this event in particular is really one that's geared towards the whole family. And, and we really are encouraging a lot of the kids to participate with games and prizes and giveaways and all kinds of fun things. So I know you guys are gonna do a lot of that, but you're also gonna just have fun and invite the whole family into the conversation of how to be healthy and, and, uh, and to make wise choices every day. So I'm excited to hear the presentation from Gina. Thank you, Jonathan. And I understand we have some Hispanic families that are also attending. Bienvenidos a todas las familias hispanas y que se diviertan mucho esta semana. Le decíamos lo mejor de parte de la farmacia, Fidelis Specialty Pharmacy. Gracias. Mucho bueno. That's all I know. I'm sorry. I really <laughs> wish that I had something great to say there, but Norma, I just appreciate you so much. And, and uh, I know that there's so many people who are excited to see you all there. Again, once again, I just want to say a big thank you from the whole, whole Hope community and family just for uh, Fidelis sponsoring this weekend and being a part of it because it really means a lot to us and the people that we get to gather together to, uh, we, you know, to, to, to support each other and be community. I, I love what you're doing and uh, looking forward to seeing your session here very soon. Great. Absolutely. Everyone have fun. All right. Thanks so much. Oh man, wasn't that so great to hear from some amazing people. I just want to say a big thank you to Andy Matthews for hanging out with me to talk more this weekend about all the things that he covered was just so good. And then of course, Debbie and David James, my parents, uh, it was great having them with me today too. And uh, of course, all of our amazing sponsors. So thank you all so much for being a part of today. Look, we are not done yet. Matter of fact, I would even say the day is just still getting started. We've got some amazing sessions for you planned this afternoon. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about them. First of all, we've got coming up here in just a little bit at around 1130 Central Time. We've got uh, Takeda actually with Sarah 
Caldwell presenting on an amazing Von Willebrand session. I think you will really enjoy that session. Uh, to learn more about what's going on with uh, research and therapy and, and the future of that. So that's exciting. A little bit later on this afternoon, we have a great session by Gina Weiberg uh, that's going to be talking about shopping smart and eating healthy. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. But look, when the kids get out of school and they're ready to uh, hop on the couch and watch some TV with mom and dad, maybe this will be a great time for you to jump in and join us for a session around 2.15, around Think, Feel, Act uh, with Gretchen. Uh, that's gonna be a fantastic uh, session as well. And then we're gonna have our virtual exhibit hall. That time is gonna be just like it was yesterday where we get an opportunity to hang out with uh, our sponsors and learn a little bit more about them. But we're gonna be doing a scavenger hunt. We'll give away another $250 gift card. And uh, you don't wanna miss an opportunity to be able to hang out with us for that. It'll be a lot of fun together. And then at five o'clock tonight, Lee Hall is going to talk a little bit about prophylaxis and the pros of doing it consistently. And there's supposed to be a great trivia game. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And so you heard from Lee earlier. He is a lot of fun and a great guy to be able to help us to learn how to treat and, and stay consistent, but also to get the kids involved with a fun trivia game at the same time. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. I think there's 15 prizes gonna be given away in that session. So much fun. So come hang out with us for that. We're doing a balloon show tonight. I mean, look, if you haven't ever, if you've ever wondered how in the world you put balloons together and twist them into becoming a Pegasus or a wiener dog i don't know this is going to be a great time to be able to have some fun with the kids and learn how to do some balloon shapes and we just want to hang out and spend some time with you then around 6 15 central time this evening and then last but not least kevin harris is going to be coming and giving us a little uh talk about health and wellness which we're talking about sporting activities and everything else at 7 30 p.m tonight so look grab some popcorn grab some food, hop on the couch, get the kids geared up. You can still register for these. If you're wondering, if you're watching this right now and you're wondering like, well, how do I get involved in this? These are the activities that we're doing in a Zoom event, each one separately. You have to go to our website at hopeforhumanphilia.org, register your email address, and we will send you the information so that you can just click on the link and jump right into the room with us. And it's a lot of fun. So Definitely do that. You have to register to win some of this prize. We're going to be giving away gift cards in each one of these sessions, just like we did yesterday. And they will be live and we'll have a lot of fun. So look, if you were living with a bleeding disorder and you want to know more about how to live a successful life, this is the place you want to be. You want to come hang out with us and be a part of our family and uh, and get, get inspired because man, this is not an easy road, but it's one that can be navigated if you keep uh, the, yourself surrounded with the right people and the right encouragement. So we want to do that with you today. We've got a surprise for you tomorrow uh, on Saturday uh, as well that I think will be a lot of fun. We'd love for you to jump back on social media with us or YouTube, jump jump in, get, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so that you can get these alerts when they pop up on YouTube. But this is a great opportunity for you to come and hang out with us and learn a little bit more tomorrow morning with a kids discussion panel. You don't want to miss this. Ages like 12, I think, to all the way to early college, we've got people living with a bleeding disorder who are going to talk to us a little bit about what it's like from a kid's perspective of living with a bleeding disorder in real time. And so uh, they've got some amazing wisdom. I know, especially towards the end, it's, uh, there's some really great opportunities to take some notes. I got to kind of listen in on some of the pre-interview questions and man, they are just doing some uh, uh, really phenomenal kids. I'm so excited about the future of our community because of great kids like this. So you don't wanna miss that opportunity tomorrow morning. Come hang out with us on social media, on YouTube, We'll be able to hang out that way, but make sure you register, get involved in these Zoom calls right now because this is a time to be able to build community, meet some people maybe you've never met before and be able to just watch from your phone or hang out with us by watching via your computer while you're getting some work done. So we've got a lot of great information coming your way. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us at events at hope-charities.org and we'll be glad to answer any of your questions. And then again, go to our website at hopeforhumanphilia.org and we'd love to be able to see you register right there. So look forward to seeing you in just a little bit. Thanks for hanging out with me today and uh, we'll see you very soon.